Hello and welcome to this week's Sabbath School Study Hour. My name is Pastor Alden Ho and I'm happy to be with you. We are actually studying from a very, very great lesson, the great controversy. And we're on lesson three this week and this is Light into Darkness. But before we start, I want to give you an offer and that is for the One World Church. If you would like to receive this offer, please call 1-866-788 3966. If you're in the United States, you can text SH076 to the number 40544. But if you happen to be outside United States or Canada or one of the U.S. territories, feel free to email or go to the website study.aftv.org forward slash SH076. And if you're outside and you can't get to a website, by all means, feel free to call or send us a letter and we'll be happy to send that out to you. Once again, thank you for joining us. And before we begin, let's bow our heads and have the Holy Spirit be with us now. Loving Father, as we open your word to be able to understand what this great controversy is about, we ask and pray for your guidance that you would be with my words as I speak, that they may be seasoned with words from on high. Help us to be able to understand where we fit in with this great controversy theme and that there is, with your help, all the possibility for us to be able to make it through this very, very challenging time. Guide and direct us right now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin our lesson today, once again, it is light shines in the darkness. And we open with the Sabbath lesson and the Sabbath is, once again, the same topic. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, John chapter 12. And we're going to understand what this light and darkness is. Jesus says to them, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. But notice also in verse 38, Jesus, or 36, Jesus is saying, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light, sons of light. Now, that's a challenge for us today because even though there is Bible truth, many times what Bible truth is in light, men will still reject it. And this is why we have the great controversy going on. There is a struggle between light and darkness. My background is photography. And having been a photographer for many years, I can tell you that Photography is all about the study of light. Now, it's very interesting when you look at the study of light, there is darkness as well. But darkness flees in the face of light. Light and darkness really can't be together. And for the very same reason, in the great controversy, we have this, the struggle between good and evil going on. I want to bring you to the great controversy book itself and from page 49, we read the following. Little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deception and blasphemous work. Almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism uh, found their way into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. So we find in this right now, this is one of the biggest challenges that we have between compromise and conformity to the compromise. On the next page of this, we're told, but as persecution ceased, Christianity entered the courts and palaces of a king. She laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. Now, we have to be very careful with this because it is not about tradition it's about what God says in his word that is truth. This closes off with the following, and it says here that the nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the fourth century caused great rejoicing 
and the world cloaked, cloaked with a form of righteousness walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. So this is kind of telling us that with all the different things that have been happening during this time period of many years ago, many centuries ago, compromise has come into the church. Things, whenever there is a, um, a watering down, whenever there is no need for Christ, people wander away. But the moment there's a calamity, the moment that there is some stress in the world, that's when everybody clamors back to church and that's when things in attendance start increasing. But this is not going to change. This will continue to compound as we get closer to Jesus' coming. In Sunday's lesson, the title is Compromise, Satan's Subtle Strategy. I wanted you to look at this to be able to understand what the Bible is saying here because Paul writes in the, first, the second chapter uh, or the second book of Thessalonians in chapter 2, looking at verse 9, Paul lays out for us exactly what Satan is doing in the last days. And he says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, all, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And it goes on. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There is a section that we find in Mrs. White's writing where she says, if you if when the Lord reveals your error, you do not confess. It says his providence will bring you over the ground again and again. You will continue to lack wisdom. You will call sin righteousness and righteousness sin. And then she says the multitude of deceptions that prevail in the last days will encircle you and you will change leaders and not know you have done so. This is what Satan is doing in these last days. And he is basing all of this on two things on this two words, Satan's lies. He lies from the very beginning when he lied to Eve. Did God say you will not surely die? He even tried to lie and he tried to deceive Jesus by saying, hey, why don't you just turn these stones into bread? But notice the difference. Eve did not quote the scriptures. She did not quote what God said. But Jesus, on the other hand, quoted and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. You see, we're told here in the great controversy that the spirit of concession to paganism opened the way for a still further disregard of heaven's authority. Satan working through unconsecrated leaders of the church tampered with the fourth commandment also and essayed to set aside the ancient Sabbath, the day which God had blessed and sanctified. Remember, we're told that of all the days of the week, seven of them, God did three things with the Sabbath day that he didn't do with any other day. He rested, he blessed it, and he made it holy. And as a result of that, what we find on the opposite side of that, Satan is working in his stead to exalt the festival, the festive or festal observance of the heathen as the venerable day of the sun. This change was not at first attempted openly. He had to work under a disguise. In the first century, the true Sabbath had only had been kept actually by all Christians. But what we find is they were jealous for the honor of God and they believing that the law is immutable they zealously regarded the sacredness of its precepts. But we find with great subtlety, Satan worked through his agents to bring about his change. Satan will work with anybody who will avail themselves to what he wants of them. And as a result, that the attention of the people might be called to the Sunday it was made a festival in honor of the resurrection of Christ we find that religious services were then held upon it 
yet it was regarded as a day of recreation, the Sabbath being still sacredly observed. So you see, Satan does not work just straight out. It's a very slippery slope where he subtly works to diminish. You can look at it this way. For those of you who live in the north where there's snow, when you put your hands in the snow and you're working with snow bare hand, and then you go to touch something hot, it feels cold. And when you go to touch something cold, it feels cold. You're numbed. And that's exactly what Satan is trying to do in these last days, is to numb us to the truth so that we would accept what he is proposing for us. And as a result of this, we find that in the early part of the fourth century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. Notice the subtle change now. The day of the sun was reverenced by his pagan subjects and was honored by the Christians. It was the emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathenism with Christianity. The Bible tells us in Amos 3.3, can two walk together unless they agree? You cannot combine heathenism and Christianity into the same thing. But while many God-fearing Christians were gradually led to regard Sunday as possessing a degree of sacredness, they still held the true Sabbath as holy of the Lord and observed in it obedience to the fourth commandment. Now, this is something that I want you to be able to look at and to be able to see for yourself. Watch very carefully here. We have three words, day of worship. And this is how Satan's going to work in the last days. He's going to work in such a way that we may, as Adventists, have the day of worship correct. But notice what happens. Satan will deceive us then in the way of worship. That's how he works in these last days. We go into Monday's lesson just touching on different things for those of you who are teachers out there. This lesson is about the savage wolves that come in. And we look in the Bible, Jesus warned us in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Therefore, hey, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Then this is where the warning comes in. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. This was the warning also that Paul gave to Timothy. Watch, watch, be ready. Be careful of those who have a form of godliness. Watch those who have itching ears. And Paul's saying, watch therefore and remember that for the three years I did not cease to warn everyone day and night with tears. The lesson points out a very good point here. In this particular day's lesson, it says, contrary to the second commandment, idols were introduced into Christian worship. For millennia, idols were in the forefront of all pagan religions. To make Christianity more acceptable, the heathens coming into the Christian church, pagan deities were renamed as so-called saints. Sunday, the day of worship for the sun god, was gradually adopted into the day of Christian worship in honor of the resurrection. But when you look at the Bible, there is nothing in the Bible that states anything about us worshiping on Sunday. There have been actually millionaires out there who have stated, if you can find something in the Bible that tells me that I need to worship on Sunday, we'll give you a million dollars. But he has not given out a penny yet because there is no such change that has happened. This false day, no sanction in this, not sanctioned in the scripture prevails even until now. When we go to Tuesday's lesson, Tuesday is about the safe guarded by the word. We're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For what reason? 
that the men of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now we jump back to the lesson again. In the lesson we find that the Bible clearly reveals God's infinite love in the light of the great controversy. Notice it also exposes satanic delusions and reveals his deceptions. The devil hates the word of God and has done everything possible throughout the centuries to destroy its influence. Our greatest need today is to study the Bible and to study the spirit of prophecy so that we would not be led away from our foundation. Why is it important to study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? Because that is where the truths are contained. Not only did God give us the word of God, but he also gave the same word spoken just like he would to his prophets in the Bible from Moses to Noah to Paul to all of them. He also spoke those same words with the same inspiration to Ellen White. And that's where we get the spirit of prophecy from. Notice what we're told about the deceptions in the last days. We're told here in the Great Controversy 593, so closely will the counterfeit resemble the true, that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. This is why it's so important for us to be able to know what the Bible says, to know what the spirit of prophecy says, so that we will not be led away from our foundation. We head now to Wednesday's lesson. And on Wednesday, we're talking about human reasoning apart from scripture. You know, I, I spend a lot of time on Facebook posting things that are of present truth. And many times I find in the Facebook posts, people like to share their opinions. Well, they would say something like, I th believe or I think. But you know what? It really doesn't matter what you think or it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what God says because what God says, that's it. I remember growing up, I had a, we had a magnet on our fridge that said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. It's not about what you think. It's not about your opinion, but it's about what the truth is that's contained in the Word of God. We find in this particular day's lesson, it points out one of the devil's most effective deceptions is to lead us to believe that human reasoning, unaided by the Holy Spirit and uninformed by the Word of God, is sufficient to understand God's will. Well, we're also told that in the Bible, in Proverbs chapter 14, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So this leads us that we must be very careful in the last days that it's not what we hear from some minister because we should never follow a minister. We should never follow a pastor. We should never follow a preacher. We must follow the word of God. And if they follow what the Bible says, then praise the Lord. But sometimes we get so hung up with speakers because of the way they talk, because of their presence, because of maybe their jokes or whatever it may be. But the bottom line is don't get caught up with them. Get caught up with what God says because that is where we need to very carefully be watching because that's where Satan is going to twist, turn, and malign the truth to be able to get people closer to him. When we move to Thursday, we find that there is a battle for the mind. It's a battle for, between Christ and Satan for the minds of men. Our mind is here. But then at the same time, this is the same area where God wants to write his law. But Satan is trying everything that he can to captivate us. He's trying everything that he can in these last days to so hone in on what our mind is about that we can't even focus on what the reality is. We've got so many video games today. We've got smartphones that are distracting to us. And even now, one of the most dangerous things out there is the Apple Vision Pro. 
These are goggles that you can put on that create this uh, unreal atmosphere. You're, you're doing things and you're touching things, but that's so surreal. Satan is doing all these things now to preoccupy our mind so that we cannot study the Word of God and we will not be able to have it in our mind. And that's how he is working today. Let's go a little deeper into that through the great controversy. Actually, sorry, not the great controversy. Through testimonies to ministers, we find on page 475, the following is said. Mrs. White, let me preface this by saying Mrs. White was privy in vision to Satan speaking to his demons. Now, this is the latter part of the whole speech that Satan was giving to his demons. But when you understand this, Satan is talking to his demons and saying, here's the plan of what I'm going to be doing in the last days. And he says, I will have upon the ground as my agents, men holding false doctrines mingled with just enough truth to deceive souls. I will have also unbelieving ones present who will express doubts in regards to the Lord's messages, messages of warnings to his church. Should the people read and believe these admonitions, we would have little hope of overcoming them. But if we can divert their attention from these warnings, how would that be? Preoccupy their mind. Get them focused on other things. Give them things that would distract them away from the word of God. They will remain ignorant of our power and cunning and we shall secure them in our ranks at last. Because God will not permit his words to be slighted with impunity. If we can keep souls deceived for a time, God's mercy will be withdrawn and he will give them up to our full control. This is exactly what Satan is trying to do in the last days. Everything that he can do to deceive us from the truth, he will do. Remember, when you look at the truth, truth is three digits. It's 100%. All Satan has to do is just take away 1% and you're down to two digits, 99. 99% truth is not enough. I mean, think of it. If I gave you a cup of water and it only contained 99% pure, but it's 1% tainted with poison, you wouldn't drink it. So then why would we take a chance on anything less than God's word and the spirit of prophecy, where we know for certain that we can receive 100% truth? Sometimes in our churches, we have many people that will quote outside sources. But the challenge that we have with outside sources is, well, I'll give you the quote from somebody who lived many years ago. His name was W.D. Frizee. Frizee says the following, Babylon does not know the way to the Most High God, and the priests of Babylon cannot tell you about the road in which they have never traveled. So in other words, a first day keeper cannot tell you about sanctification because they don't know, they don't understand it. If they understood sanctification, if they understood what is involved with the sanctuary, then guess what? They wouldn't be a first day keeper. They would be a seventh day keeper and they would be keeping not just nine of God's commandments, but all 10 of them. Let's look in our closing thoughts for Friday. Friday's further thoughts, we look at early writings. In the book, Early Writings, Mrs. White gives us the following. She says, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown. It would be caused by the straight testimony called for by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Now, I had read somewhere else too that the shaking, she said, has already begun. During her time period, the shaking has begun. And what causes this shaking? Well, we find that this will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight testimony. The standard is not a standard that we have set up. This is a standard that Christ has set up for us. But as a result of holding to the standard, we find that some will not bear the straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what causes the shaking among God's people. In the time in which we are living right now, the shaking is happening. We must be prepared, as Mrs. White said before, to meet it head on. 
we must be able to understand what the Bible truth is and to be able to stand for that no matter what happens because Satan is looking for us to compromise. And that's what he's trying to do is chip away at the foundation that we're standing on so that we would crumble with that. I encourage you this week, stand firm for the Lord and study his word. Don't fail to keep pressing forward. Paul writes and he says, I press toward the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I pray that that is for you today, that you would study very earnestly. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for all that you have done for us. Thank you for giving us this lesson. Thank you for the great controversy to be able to warn us that we must be on our guard, that we must not be deceived, that we must understand what Bible truth is. Please continue to be with your people as we study this lesson. Continue to grow us to be truly your children. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want and most important, to share it with others.